We will now begin the section called Political Institutions, using the rules to increase chances of getting what you want. Over the next few weeks, we will study the three branches of government, namely the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. First, we'll begin with the legislative branch, corresponding with Chapter 6 of your textbook. First, we want to go over some terms. In the legislative branch, we have both representatives from the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, which has senators. The people who work in both the U.S. House of Representatives and the United States Senate are called congressmen and congresswomen. When we refer to Congress, we refer to both of these houses of government. As we've stated before, we have a bicameral legislature, and so at the national level, we have two houses, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. We commonly call people who work for the U.S. Senate senators, and people who call the people who work for the U.S. House of Representatives representatives. However, if somebody tells you to write your congressman or write your congresswoman or get in touch with Congress, they are meaning both of these houses. And we'll see why shortly. Both of the houses have to work together in order for laws to be passed. The Great Compromise created one Congress with two houses. In the U.S. House of Representatives, we had a house which was based on population. We used Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution to talk about the U.S. House of Representatives and how the members of that house are going to be chosen. We talked a little bit about population as the basis for the House of Representatives and how we had a differing number of representatives from each state depending on the population of the state in question. On the other hand, we have the United States Senate, which is described in Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution. And instead of using population, the Great Compromise decided that each represent representative was going to come from each state in a proportional manner. In other words, we would have two representatives from each state, which would be a proportional 100 from the whole 50 units put together. Both the senators and the representatives work in the U.S. Capitol building. So if you're looking for members of Congress when you're in Washington, D.C., this is where you would find them. The North Wing is home to the U.S. Senate. This is where they have their hearings and they do their work. The South Wing is home to the U.S. House of Representatives. This is where they have their hearing and they do their work. In between them is a very picturesque monument, uh, which is called the Great Rotunda. We have um, a lot of different things which go on in there, uh, a lot of uh, events which happen at the Capitol will be held, for example, in the Great Rotunda. And this is the place where both the senators and the representatives meet, crossing over each other in the middle. Let's begin our discussion of the House of Representatives, and we'll use Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution to us. The House of Representatives seats by population. So how do we figure out how many people we have in the different states to figure out how many seats there are going to be in the House and how many representatives get to come from each state? Well, the first thing we have to do is enumerate. Enumeration is the counting of people. You may have remembered the Census 2010, which just recently passed us. The United States takes a census every 10 years. The sole purpose of the census is to determine how many representatives each state have in Congress, or at least that's what it was initially intended to do. Now we use the census for very many different things, not only to determine how many representatives each state will get, we use it for federal funding, we use it for demographic data, and we use a lot of different uh, information which we gather from the census to figure out how to allocate different resources to different parts of the states and different states within the Union. On the average, we have a size of one district seat in the House of Representatives representing 646,952 people. And this is a lot, considering in 1790, you'll remember we counted about 4 million people who lived in the entire United States, who were underneath the, the jurisdiction of the United States of America. In 2011, right after the last census, we counted 310,942,249. So you can see how much we're growing as a country. 
And actually, you can visit the Census Bureau's website, and they will tell you there's a live clock going about their estimates on how many people there are in the United States uh, at any given moment who have been counted and who, you know, based on their their uh, estimates are currently being counted and currently being born into the United States population. Of course, we don't get the actual numbers until we do the census once every 10 years. And even that, uh, we use certain forms which we have to aggregate from that what our actual population is going to be and the demographics thereof. Reapportionment and redistricting. These are two very important concepts that I want you to know about and know the difference between because they're very important when we're dealing with figuring out how many seats are going to be uh, given to each state and within the states how those seats are going to look. The first one is reapportionment. Reapportionment is the process by which Congress allocates the number of representatives for each state based on new population numbers from the census. So in other words, every time we do a census, we count and we can figure out how many people there are in the state. And we can say, okay, California gained a couple of people, Texas maybe lost a couple of people, and since we have to make sure that this is based on population, a gain by one state in population is going to mean that they're going to gain um, a seat in the House of Representatives. Now, if everybody gains, if all the states were to gain population at once, uh, then, of course, we wouldn't see too much of a difference. But if one state loses population and another state gains population, then you'll see the shift, and this is what's called reapportionment. At the end of the census, we count everybody up, we determine where people have moved to, where people have been born, what the different uh, demographics of the states are looking like in terms of their population now, and then we apportion the seats. We say, okay, we have 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, and so we are going to divvy those up depending on how many people live in each state. The following process is called redistricting, and you might have remembered there was a big to-do about this right after uh, we had the census in 2010. Redistricting is the process by which each state draws the boundaries of congressional districts in order to keep the districts equal in population. And so, for example, you have your congressperson who represents the district which you live in. That district may not look like a square. In fact, it doesn't look like a square, uh, especially if you live in California. And it might look quite different from the district next to you. Well, why is that? It's because each, each of the congressional districts actually has to have the same number of people in it, plus or minus one. And so, depending on where people live, this is going to change the way districts look. If people live in an area that's shaped like an L, then you're going to get districts that are shaped like an L. If people are spread out in a huge cloud, then you're going to get a district that's very large, which encompasses that whole group of people, in order to make one district have the same number of people in another district. This is why you'll see, for example, in very densely populated areas like Los Angeles, for example, we have many small districts, whereas if you were to go up to Northern California, taking a look at Modoc, Del Norte counties, for example, way up there, you see very large districts because the population is much smaller, and so we have to get, gather more people across a larger area in order to make up for that population difference. In California, we have the Citizens Redistricting Commission, which is in charge of drawing the lines and taking testimony from all over the state as to how the lines should be drawn. They have different criteria which they use, which is provided for them under state law and in the California Constitution, and they do this to make sure that we have fair districts for the purposes of voting on our Congress people, particularly our representatives, into Congress during the next elections. It's important to know your representative, and as we talked about when we mentioned federalism before, you can look up online where the exact boundaries of your representative's district are. Remember, they're going to change every 10 years, and so you may have lived in one district before the 2010 census and then found yourself in a brand new district right afterwards, and that's because the lines are going to change as population shifts over time. Right now, the district which... Uh, 
if you live in Laney or, or around uh, the college in Oakland, or if you live where I do, your representative is Barbara Lee, and she is representing uh, the 9th District. Her district number is going to change depending on what is assigned at the redistricting commission's final tallies of all of the different districts. And so, for example, if she represented the 9th district before 2010, her district number might be something completely different now, which has nothing to do with the districts themselves and everything to do with how they were numbered as they were coming down through the redistricting commissions, um, through their, um, how they then numbered the districts for representation going forward. We have 435 voting delegates. This represents 435 seats which we have coming from the 50 states. But we also have non-voting delegates. Non-voting delegates are delegates who are able to come be Congress people. They are actually members of the House of Representatives. However, they actually do not get a vote in Congress. So what's the point of having a non-voting delegate, you may ask, if they don't actually get a chance to vote? Well, they get a chance to do research, they get a chance to influence the other representatives who are there, and to do things which are going to help educate them to the needs of their particular populations. In Congress today, we have five non-voting delegates in the House of Representatives. They come from Guam, American Samoa, the CNMI, that's the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Washington, D.C. Yes, Washington, D.C. has their own representative, although that representative actually has no vote in the House of Representatives. Puerto Rico does not have a voting non-voting delegate, but they do send a resident commissioner uh, who is able to do many, many of the same things. So it's important to know that our various territories and commonwealths that we maintain throughout the world also have some representation, even if it's not voting representation, in the House of Representatives. The head of the House of Representatives is known as the Speaker of the House. This is the highest officer in the legislative branch. This person is elected by a majority vote in the House, and so normally it's a caucus of the ruling political party. Whichever political party is going to have more members in the House of Representatives is going to come together and vote, and they're going to decide who gets to be the Speaker of the House. Because, of course, they're going to have more votes than the minority party. So even if they did it all together, it really would be a wash. They'd really have the majority candidate uh, coming out as the head anyway. This person is important for many reasons. Not only being the head of the legislative branch in terms of the highest officer, but they are also next in line after the vice president to be president in the event of a catastrophe. Of course, we don't like to think of anything horrible happening to our president and vice president. However, we do have something called the chain of succession or the line of succession. And what this is, is it's actually written in that if something were to happen to our president, the vice president would take his place. And if something were to happen to the president and the vice president, then the next in line to automatically be president would be the speaker of the house. The current speaker of the is John Boehner. He is a representative and he represents, uh, sorry, he's a Republican and he represents uh, an Ohio legislative district currently. This is what the floor of the House of Representatives looks like. You may have seen this on CNN, on C-SPAN. Uh, you can see at the very front, you have a little gallery there with the American flag. Sitting right in front of that, you're going to have... Um, the Speaker of the House, uh, you, well, I can't exactly see from this picture which one he is, and then the person speaking right in front of him. On either side of the aisle, you'll have on one side the Democratic Party, and on the other side you'll have the Republican Party. And so you can see how when they say that a particular congressperson crosses the aisle or works across the aisle, they literally mean it. They mean that they are going across the aisle to work with somebody from the other party because the parties tend to cluster very closely together. You can also see uh, a bunch of staffers who are all over, to, particularly in the front. The dais in the front where they're sitting, you can see some uh, reporters and staffers there whose job it is to take down the minutes of what is going on in that particular legislative hearing. If you look at the very top of the picture, you can see people watching up in the gallery up there uh, who are taking note of what's going on in the proceedings of this particular session of the House of Representatives.